I'm Evan B. Howard, and this is the 20th in our series of lecture videos on the spirituality of Christian worship. Today's lecture is entitled, Worship as an Act of Mission, Mission as an Act of Worship. And as you can see, we're exploring in this lecture the relationship between mission and worship. But I want to begin by reviewing our definition of worship. Now, we've been talking about this from the beginning, and so by now... I should be looking out into my classroom and asking, uh, is there anybody in this class who can remember and recite for me the definition of worship we've given all the way through this course? So is there? I can. Oh, great. Great. Could you go right ahead. Christian worship is simply the acknowledgement of God's supreme value in gesture, in disposition, in habit or in voice. We speak of worship as an attitude or an act of reverence and as a total life orientation. We also speak of worship as an event, an event within which I revere God and rehearse or restore my fundamental orientation towards God. Christian worship is the acknowledgement of God as present in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit both personally known and interpersonally present, even in the midst of the acts of our acknowledging God. Well, that's marvelous. Thank you. So you got it. That is what worship is. So with that in mind, we want to ask the question, what does worship accomplish? And how is this worship related to mission? We've seen worship, it's the acknowledgement of God's supreme value, however we, we do that. How is that related to missions? Well, point number one under that. The act of worship itself is a statement to the nations. The act of worship itself is a statement to the nations. You see, who we worship is itself a way of saying something. The fact that we, the Israelites refused to worship the idols, to refuse to offer sacrifices to them, refuse to burn incense, even the way that the Israelites plowed their fields or, or you know, had a relationship with their bulls and the obedience of the law itself was a worshipful act toward God and a statement to their neighboring nations that this is who we are, and this God, this God is the God. You see, the idea is that the nations are going to know there is no God like our God, who delivered us from the Egyptians, parted the Red Sea, brought us into the land, gave us a law, gave us a land, gave us uh, leaders, you know, all of this thing, so that we would be able to live full of prosperity and be a light to the nations. Christopher Wright, in his wonderful book, The Mission of God, says this about the worship and its relationship to the nations within Israel. The good news of what God had done for Jerusalem, Chris writes, would constitute part of the good news that would go also to the nations when, quote, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Quoting from Isaiah 52.10 and also with reference to Jeremiah 31.10. How would this would happen is never clearly articulated in the Old Testament, but that it would happen is unequivocal. It is celebrated in advance, Chris Wright says, in worship and prophecy. And here we have the prophetic worship from Psalm 96, 1 through 3. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. Do you hear that connection between worship and proclamation? between proclamation and evangelization. And in Isaiah, Isaiah 12, verses 4 through 5, 
Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And proclaim that his name is exalted. Listen to that, that blend of worship and mission. Proclaim his name is exalted. You're lifting him up. You're proclaiming. Sing to the Lord. For he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Then Chris Wright goes on and says, Israel believed that they had come to know God, Yahweh, as the one and only true and living God. In his transcendent uniqueness, there was no other God like Yahweh. Furthermore, they had a sense of the stewardship of this knowledge, since it was God's purpose that ultimately all nations would come to know the name, the glory, the salvation, and the mighty acts of Yahweh, and worship Him alone as God. You see, you can't worship without it being a matter of mission. The act of worshiping the only true God is itself a statement to the nations. Now, what's fascinating is that if you move that from the Old Testament, to you know, kind of our postmodern, um, increasingly post-Christian West, for example, it means this: the very act of going to church, the very act of going to church, is a statement to the world. What do I do with my time? Well, on Sunday mornings, this is what I do with my time. I wake up early and, and I use some of my weekend time to go to this place where I recite a creed, where I sing some songs, and I acknowledge that my entire life is based on this God that I think is the true one and only God. Believe me, it was a countercultural move for Israel and it's a countercultural move today. Attending church is countercultural. It's a statement of worship and it's a statement of mission. So, the act of worship is itself a statement to the nations. Second point I want to make under what does worship accomplish and how is it related to missions is this the Lord responds to worship on behalf of mission. And we see this again and again in Scripture. I'm just going to read a, a couple of examples, a few examples. Second Chronicles, um, chapter 20. Um, here we've got um, Zechariah, or actually um, Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. And here we are, as a Jehosh Jehoshaphat, and in this era of the kings. And the Spirit of the Lord, notice, remember, it's the Spirit leading here. We've talked a lot about the Spirit came on Jehaziah, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, etc., as he stood in the assembly. So here you are in a worship gathering, and the Spirit falls on this guy, and then he says, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Because Jehoshaphat is about to go into this battle. And here we go. What are we going to do? Jehoshaphat's a little scared, but no, you're having a church service, and there's a word from the Lord that comes on Jehaziel. And he says, don't be afraid. The battle is not yours, but God's. And they move on. Jehoshaphat bows down with, uh, with his face to the ground, and all the people of Jerusalem and Judah fell down and worshiped before the Lord. So you've got this service going on, and then this prophetic word comes out, and then they all decide to worship. Well, what happens after that? Early in the morning, I'm up to verse 20 now, they left for the desert of Tekoa. And as they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. Well, he better be having faith in his prophets and in the Lord because we have this prophetic word telling him that this battle is God's battle. So what do they do? After consulting the people, and that's interesting, you get a, the people involved in this, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. So what you've got is this army going out to battle. And instead of the ranks of of those with the spears, or instead of the ranks of those with the shields that are out front, or instead of your tanks, or whatever it might be, 
Here they are, and it's the ones with the loots. It's the people with their, you know, with, with um, harps and, and um, whistles and, and flutes, you know. They're the ones at the front of the army. And they're singing praises to God. And verse 22 says, As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were de de invading Judah, and they were defeated. So there you go. The Lord responded to worship on behalf of the mission, namely the mission of the promotion of the kingdom of God and the way the kingdom of God was being advanced in this period of time, namely through the preservation and expansion of the nation of Israel. Now, when we move into the book of Acts, we find a very similar thing going on, only it's not national warfare, but the spread of the word of God through the spirit of God um, more generally. And after Jesus died, all of the people, you've got these people who gather in the upper room, and it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, they all join together, notice, they're joining together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So, you've got this gathering going on in what's called an upper room. And they're praying, they're worshiping, and they're constantly. So, Acts chapter 2, we jump to Acts chapter 2, and it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Well, what were they doing in that one place? Obviously, they were all together in prayer, just like the previous chapter said. And suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Now, you again, you've got the association of the Holy Spirit here too. Previously you have the Holy Spirit giving instructions for the battle. Now you have them gathering together in prayer and the Holy Spirit fills them and they speak with other tongues. Well, what happens? These people, I mean, you know the story. They speak with other tongues. People are surprised. What's going on? Peter gives a message, says, hey, this is the fulfillment of Joel. You know, God is sending a whole new era. And they say, well, what, what do we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Well, when you get to verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So you see, worship and God responds to the worship with the power of His Spirit for the sake of mission. For the sake of mission. You see the same kind of thing in Acts chapter 4. You've got this prayer meeting going on in Acts chapter 4. And they give this prayer where they really worship the praise. You know, the kings rise up together, um, the rulers, and they, they inspire. They talk about the, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And they declare, they worship the sovereignty of God. And then they bring forth this, this threat that was going to happen to Peter and them. And so after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Again, worship is responded to. God responds to worship with the power of the Spirit for the sake of missions. We see the same thing again in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, where um, people are meeting together and they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. And the Holy Spirit, again, says... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And guess what? This is the first, you know, outgoing, you know, the first overseas mission. Is you've got Paul and Barnabas sent um, from this gathering of worship and fasting. Finally, one final example in the book of Revelation, chapter 8. A seventh seal and the golden censer. Another uh, angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, you get this, the incense and the prayers of God's people, the worship goes up to God. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar. So here you are in heaven, you've got this incense and the prayers of God's people up. And then he hurls it onto the earth. 
And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And immediately following this, you have the description of the trumpets, the accomplishment of God's mission in history. Worship is responded to by God for the sake of God's mission. The worship of God affects the mission of God. So that's my point. What does worship accomplish? The act of worship itself is a statement to the nations, and, and the God of worship responds to the worship of God for the sake of the mission of God. So, having asked the question of worship and how it relates to mission, let's flip that around the other side. What is the mission of God and how is that ultimately related to worship? And after that, we then go back to our lecture on the big story. The story of the big mission of God. The big a plan of God for humanity that we did I, I early on in the lectures. This is what I called, if you remember, the all things new story. God creates. God recreates. This is what God wants in life, is to create and recreate. God delivers, God invites us, era by era by era, to partner with God um, in exercising a caring rulership over planet Earth. This involves a reconciliation with God, with self, with one another, and even with nature and the, and the Earth itself. God wants us, desires us, to be in league with Him ruling this planet. We saw it in Genesis chapter 1. We saw it in Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. You will reign with Him forever and ever. This is God's big vision. God, and I call it the all things new uh, vision. Mission of God is to all things, we need to reconcile all things to God. Now, how does this relate to worship? Well, let's talk about this mission and worship, mission and worship events, and then we'll talk about mission and worship life, and then we'll say something else. Mission and the worship events. We model the mission of God by the manner in which we conduct our worship services, our worship gatherings. We model the mission of God by how we conduct our worship of God. The, the one, one way I like to illustrate this is imagine you're in our oh, 1960s. And um, you, you hear we're looking at a middle-aged, white, um, southern um, head of the household family in the early 60s. And he's got this, this white, um, you know, southern head of the household has got some guests. And one of the guests comes and, and starts talking about the way the niggers is. And that white southern head of the household says, you don't say that word in my house. This is my house. And if you're going to be in my house, you aren't going to use that word nigger. We treat African, we treat black people right. And we consider them to be you know, real people in our household. And if you're going to be in my household, this is the way you're going to conduct things. And so you, you get the idea. Not in my house, you don't. Well, guess what? When we have a worship gathering, we're in the house of God. We are in the house of God. And God is the head of the family. And I can imagine God, the head of the family, looking over our worship services and saying, let's say with regard to 1 Corinthians 13, in my house, we're patient with one another. In my house, we're kind to each other. We don't treat people like that. In my house, we are jealous. In my house, we don't get angry like that. We don't keep records of wrongs. You see? So when we worship, we proclaim the mission of God by the very way 
we conduct our worship service. We reflect this all things new gospel by how we relate to one another. And we can could, we could think of 1 Timothy 2. God, in my house, we pray for the people in authority. In my house, we stay away from fruitless controversies and we focus on godliness with contentment. So how we behave in God's house is itself a model of the mission of God. So, furthermore, how we act in the house of worship then models the mission that we live in our life of worship. See, the love we treat people within the house of God, within the worship of God, is the kind of love we want to show to our neighbors in our life of worship. The presence we experience in the worship of God is the presence that we manifest to our neighbors in our life of worship. The power that we explore in our events of worship is the power we learn to communicate in our life of worship. You see how that works? Worship events put us in touch with the very center of the mission that we're going to live in the life of worship. So worship life as our expression of reverence and submission to God. We live it in the, we kind of microcosm live it in the middle of the worship event. But then it gets expressed in everything we do. Our acknowledgement of the supreme value of God. Remember, that's the definition of worship. Simply the acknowledgement of God's supreme value. We do that when we, we, we and then when we, the, our acknowledgement of God's supreme value, which we express so clearly when we meet together for our worship services, is then lived out in the way we care for our extended families, in the way we conduct our occupations, and even in the way we shop. Every aspect of our life either declares or denies the supreme value of God in our lives. You see? So our life of our, our, our events of worship model and lead us into a life of worship, which is actually a life of mission. And then there is something bigger. Then there is something bigger. Something eschatological. You see, in worship, in our events of worship, we practice, we embody, we rehearse the world to which we are called. Think, for example, about the simple act of singing songs from people all over the world. Maybe we even don't even have anybody in our congregation that's from this part of the world or from that part of the world. C. Michael Hahn writes of this practice that, he calls the practice liturgical plurality, trying to include different groups in our worship, whether or not we have those members in our congregation. He writes, liturgical plurality is essentially eschatological. It is imbued with the hope for things that will be. You see, the practice of singing songs from other people emphasizes that our worship here and now is really merely a reflection of a time that was. You know, it's just a current uh, mirror of cultural reality. But it can also be, and is much more truly, a proclamation, and indeed a taste, of a world which is yet to come. Our worship points us toward a world, a mission, the fulfillment of which is what eschatology, is what the gospel, the mission of God, is all about. You see... What does worship accomplish? Worship, and the act of worship, is a statement to the nations. 
The Lord responds to worship on behalf of missions. How is the mission of God related to worship? Uh, the mission of God through worship events is the manner by which we conduct our worship life. And then our worship life models and embodies the very act that we have in worship. And then there's this something bigger. Well, what we do on Sunday mornings in our worship events points us toward the fulfillment of the very character of the worship of God. Now all of this is, is summarized perhaps most clearly, is expressed most clearly in a small paragraph placed at the end of most liturgical worship service. It is called, generally called, the dismissal or the benediction. Let me read you one example. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Notice the points. We have been fed through the sacrament. We have experienced as, uh, the, the, part, the fact that we are living members of the body of your Son by the gathering of the people around the bread and the receiving as one people the body and blood of Christ. We see ourselves as members. Heirs of your eternal kingdom. Again, the very fact of what we gained in Genesis 1, what we were commanded in Genesis 1, is then our, our inheritance in Revelation 22.5. We will reign with him forever and ever. That's the big story. And then, because of all this, and now, Father, send us out. Send us out to do the work you have given us to do. And you know what that work is. All things made new. Restore, reconcile, make new. As faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, you see, and then the honor and the glory be to him. We are representatives. We bring that glory. The worship that we have just had in here, in our worship gallery, we now want to express and live as we are sent out to honor, to show to the rest of the world God's supreme value through everything in which we do. So you see, <clears throat> our worship gatherings are also mission gatherings, proclaiming both by the fact of the gathering and by the culture of this gathering the very story we proclaim to the world. Furthermore, our mission activities, indeed our very lives, are acts of worship, demonstrating the supreme value of the Christian God. Go then, into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord with gladness and singleness of heart. And while doing this, I hope you have a wonderful day.